new consciousness is developing which sees the Earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. The Zeitgeist Movement Defined Realizing a New Train of Thought The tremendous and still accelerating development of science and technology has not been accompanied by an equal development in social, economic, and political patterns. We are now only beginning to explore the potentialities which it offers for developments in our culture outside technology, particularly in the social, political, and economic fields. It is safe to predict that, such social inventions as modern-type capitalism, fascism, and communism will be regarded as primitive experiments directed toward the adjustment of modern society to modern technology. Dr. Ralph Linton www.thezeitgeistmovement.com The Zeitgeist Movement Defined Realizing a New Train of Thought First Edition, January, 2014 Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International The content in this text may be reproduced only for non-commercial purposes and may not be resold in any form. Any other interests require direct approval by TZM Global. Contact media at thezeitgeistmovement.com This is a 100% non-profit text. Any price paid is only for the physical publishing. Any exploitation of this work for profit will not be tolerated. Acknowledgements, the material authored here is the product of many forms of contribution, specifically the research of the Zeitgeist Movement's expanding lecture team. An enormous thanks extends to all who have contributed news, sources, tips and other forms of research. If you would like to help in translating this text, please contact TZM's linguistics team, linguisticteam at gmail.com. Preface the outcome of any serious research can only be to make two questions grow where only one grew before. Thorstein Veblen. Origin of the name. The Zeitgeist Movement, TZM, is the identifier for the social movement described in the following essays. The name has no relevant historical reference to anything culturally specific and is not to be confused or associated with anything else known before with a similar title. Rather, the title is based upon the semantic meaning of the very terms, explicitly. The term zeitgeist is defined as the general intellectual, moral and cultural climate of an era. The term movement simply implies motion or change. Therefore, the zeitgeist movement is an organization that urges change in the dominant intellectual, moral and cultural climate of the time. Document Structure the following text has been prepared to be as concise and yet comprehensive as possible. In form it is a series of essays ordered by subject in a manner that works to support a broader context. While each essay is designed to be taken on its own merit and evaluation, the true context resides in how each issue works to support a larger train of thought with respect to the most efficient organization of human society. It will be noticed by those who read through these essays in a linear fashion that a fair amount of overlap exists with certain ideas or subjects. This is deliberate as such repetition and emphasis is considered helpful given how foreign some of the concepts might seem to those with no prior exposure to such material. Also, since only so much detail can be afforded to maintain comprehension given the gravity of each subject and how they interrelate, great effort has been made to source relevant third-party research throughout each essay via footnotes, allowing the reader to follow through with further study as the interest arises. The Organism of Knowledge As with any form of presented research, we are dealing with serially generated data composites. 
observation, its assessment, documentation and integration with other knowledge, existing or pending, is the manner by which all distinguishable ideas come to evolve. This continuum is important to understand with respect to the way we think about what we believe and why, for information is always separate in its merit from the person or institution communicating or representing. Information can only be evaluated correctly through a systematic process of comparison to other physically verifiable evidence as to its proof or lack thereof. Likewise, this continuum also implies that there can be no empirical origin of ideas. From an epistemological perspective, knowledge is mostly culminated, processed and expanded through communication amongst our species. The individual, with his or her inherently different life experience and propensities, serves as a custom processing filter by which a given idea can be morphed. Collectively, we individuals comprise what could be called a group mind, which is the larger order social processor by which the efforts of individuals ideally coalesce. The traditional method of data transfer through literature, sharing books from generation to generation, has been a notable path of this group mind interaction, for example. Isaac Newton perhaps put this reality best with the statement, If I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. This is brought up here in order to focus the reader on the critical consideration of data, not a supposed source, as there actually is no such thing in an empirical sense. It is only in the temporal, traditional patterns of culture, such as with literary credits in a textbook for future research reference, is such a recognition technically relevant. There is no statement more erroneous than the declaration that this is my idea. Such notions are byproducts of a material culture that has been reinforced in seeking physical rewards, usually via money, in exchange for the illusion of their proprietary creations. Very often an ego association is culminated as well where an individual claims prestige about their credit for an idea or invention. Yet, that is not to exclude gratitude and respect for those figures or institutions that have shown dedication and perseverance towards the expansion of knowledge itself, nor to diminish the necessity of importance of those who have achieved a skilled, specialized expert status in a particular field. The contributions of brilliant thinkers and engineers such as our Buckminster Fuller, Jock Fresco, Jeremy Rifkin, Ray Kurzweil, Robert Sapolsky, Thorstein Veblen, Richard Wilkinson, James Gilligan, Carl Sagan, Nikola Tesla, Stephen Hawking and many, many more researchers, past and present, are quoted and sourced in this text and serve as part of the larger data composite you are about to read. Great gratitude is also expressed here towards all dedicated minds that are working to contribute to an improving world. That understood, the Zeitgeist movement claims no origination of any idea it promotes and is best categorized as an activist slash educational institution that works to amplify a context upon which existing slash emerging scientific findings may find a concerted social imperative. Part 1. Introduction. Overview. Neither the great political and financial power structures of the world, nor the specialization-blinded professionals, nor the population in general realize that, it is now highly feasible to take care of everybody on earth at a higher standard of living than any have ever known. It no longer has to be you or me. Selfishness is unnecessary and henceforth unrationalizable as mandated by survival. War is obsolete. Our Buckminster Fuller. About. Founded in 2008, the Zeitgeist Movement, TZM, is a sustainability advocacy group that operates through a network of regional chapters project teams, public events, media expressions and charity operations. TZM's activism is explicitly based on nonviolent methods of communication with the core focus on educating the public about the true root sources of many common personal, social and ecological problems today, coupled with the vast problems solving and humanity improving potential science and technology has now enabled, but yet goes unapplied due to barriers inherent in the current, established social system. While the term activism is correct by its exact meaning, TZM's awareness work should not be misconstrued as relating to culturally common, traditional activist protest actions such as we have seen historically. Rather, TZM expresses itself through targeted, rational educational projects that work not to impose, dictate, or blindly persuade, but to set in motion a train of thought that is logically self-realizing when the causal considerations of sustainability and public health are referenced from a scientific perspective. However, 
TZM's pursuit is still very similar to traditional civil rights movements of the past in that the observations reveal the truly unnecessary oppression inherent in our current social order, which structurally and sociologically restricts human well-being and potential for the vast majority of the world's population, not to mention stifles broad improvement in general due to its established methods. For instance, the current social model, while perpetuating enormous levels of corrosive economic inefficiency in general, as will be described in further essays, also intrinsically supports one economic group or class of people over another, perpetuating technically unnecessary imbalance and high relative deprivation. This could be called economic bigotry in its effect and it is no less insidious than discrimination rooted in gender, ethnicity, religion, creed or the like. However, this inherent bigotry is really only a part of a larger condition that could be termed structural violence, illuminating a broad spectrum of built-in suffering, inhumanity and deprivation that is simply accepted as normality today by an uninformed majority. This context of violence stretches much farther and deeper than many tend to consider. The scope of how our socioeconomic system unnecessarily diminishes our public health and inhibits our progress today can only be recognized clearly when we take a more detached technical or scientific perspective of social affairs, bypassing our traditional, often blinding familiarities. The relative nature of our awareness often falls victim to assumptions of perceived normality where, say, the ongoing deprivation and poverty of over 3 billion people might be seen as a natural, inalterable social state to those who are not aware of, for example, the amount of food actually produced in the world, where it goes, how it is wasted or the technical nature of efficient and abundant food production possibilities in the modern day. This unseen violence can be extended to cultural memes as well where social traditions and their psychology can, without direct malicious intent, create resulting consequences that are damaging to a human being. For instance, there are religious cultures in the world that opt out of any form of common medical treatment. While many might argue the moral or ethical parameters of what it means for a child in such a culture to die of a common illness that could have been resolved if modern scientific applications were allowed, we can at least agree that the death of such a child is really being caused not by the disease at that point, but by the sociological condition that disallowed the application of the solution. As a broader example, a great deal of social study has now been done on the subject of social inequality and its effects on public health. As will be discussed more so in further essays, there is a vast array of physical and mental health problems that appear to be born out of this condition, including propensities towards physical violence, heart disease, depression, educational deficiency and many, many other detriments that have a truly social consequence which can affect us all. The bottom line here is that when we step back and consider newly realized understandings of causality that are clearly having negative effects on the human condition, but go unabated unnecessarily do the pre-existing traditions established by culture, we inevitably end up in the context of civil rights and hence social sustainability. This new civil rights movement is about the sharing of human knowledge and our technical ability to not only solve problems, but to facilitate a scientifically derived social system that actually optimizes our potential and well-being. Anything less will create unnecessary imbalance and social destabilization and constitute what could be considered a hidden form of oppression. So, returning to the broad point, TZM works not only to create awareness of such problems and their true root causes, and hence logic for resolution, it also works to express the incredible potential we have, beyond such direct problem solving, to greatly improve the human condition in general, solving problems which, in fact, have not yet even been realized. This is initiated by embracing the very nature of scientific reasoning, where the establishment of a near-empirical train of thought takes precedence over everything else in importance. A train of thought by which societal organization as a whole can find a more accurate context for sustainability and efficiency on a scale never before seen, through an act of recognition and application of the scientific method. Focus TZM's broad actions could be summarized as to diagnose, educate and create. Diagnose Diagnosis is the identification of the nature and cause of anything. To properly diagnose the causal condition of the vast social and ecological problems common to modern culture is not merely to complain about them or criticize the actions of people or particular institutions, as is frequent today. A true diagnosis must seek out the lowest causal denominator possible and work at that level for resolution. The central problem is that there is often what could be called a truncated frame of reference, where short-sighted, misdiagnosis of given consequences persist. 
For instance, the traditional, established solution to the reformation of human behavior for many so-called criminal acts is often punitive incarceration. Yet, this says nothing about the deeper motivation of the criminal and why their psychology led to such acts, to begin with. At that level, such a resolution becomes more complex and reliant upon the synergetic relationship of their physical and cultural culmination over time. This is no different than when a person dies of cancer, as it isn't really the cancer that kills them in the literal sense, as the cancer itself is the product of other forces. Educate. As an educational movement that operates under the assumption that knowledge is the most powerful tool we have to create lasting, relevant social change in the global community, there is hence nothing more critical than the quality of one's personal education and their ability to communicate such ideas effectively and constructively to others. TCM is not about following a rigid text of static ideas. Such confined, narrow associations are typical of religious and political cults, not the recognition of emergence that underscores the anti-establishment nature of TZM. TZM does not impose in this sense. Rather, it works to make an open-ended train of thought become realized by the individual, hopefully empowering their independent ability to understand its relevance on their own terms, at their own pace. Furthermore, education is not only an imperative for those unfamiliar with this train of thought and the application set related, but also for those who already subscribe to it. Just as there is no utopia, there is no final state of understanding. Create. While certainly related to the need to adjust human values through education so the world's people understand the need for such social changes, TZM also works to consider how a new social system, based on optimum economic efficiency, would appear and operate in detail given our current state of technical ability. Programs such as the Global Redesign Institute, which is a digital think tank that works to express how the core societal infrastructure could unfold based on our current state of technology, working to combine that technical capacity with the scientific train of thought so as to calculate the most efficient technical infrastructure possible for any given region of the world, is one example. It is worth briefly noting that TZM's advocated governance approach, which has little semblance to the current manner of governance known today or historically, originates out of a multidisciplinary bridging of various proven methods for maximized optimization, unified through a counterbalancing systems approach that is designed to be as adaptive as possible to new, emerging improvements over time. As will be discussed at length, the only possible reference that could be considered most complete at any given time is one that takes into account the largest interacting observations, system, tangibly relevant. This is the nature of the cause and effect synergy that underscores the technical basis for a truly sustainable economy. Natural law slash resource-based economy. Today, various terms exist to express the general logical basis for a more scientifically oriented social system in different circles, including the titles resource-based economy or natural law economy. While these titles are historically referential and somewhat arbitrary overall, the title natural law slash resource-based economy, NLRBE, will be utilized here since it has the most concrete semantic basis. A natural law slash resource-based economy is defined as an adaptive socioeconomic system actively derived from direct physical reference to the governing scientific laws of nature. Overall, the observation is that through the use of socially targeted research and tested understandings in science and technology, we are now able to logically arrive at societal approaches which could be profoundly more effective in meeting the needs of the human population. We are now able to dramatically increase public health, better preserve the habitat, create a general material abundance, while also strategically reduce or eliminate many common social problems present today which are sadly considered inalterable by many due to their cultural persistence. Train of thought. Many figures or groups have worked to create temporally advanced technological applications, working to apply current possibilities to this train of thought in order to enable new efficiencies and problem solving such as Jock Fresco's City Systems or our Buckminster Fuller's Dimaction House. Yet, as obviously important as this applied engineering is, it is still critical to remember that all specific technological applications can only be transient when the evolution of scientific knowledge and its emerging technological applications are taken into account. In other words, all current applications of technology tend to become obsolete over time. Therefore, what is left can only be a train of thought with respect to the underlying causal scientific principles. TZM is hence loyal to this train of thought, 
not figures, institutions or temporal technological advancements. Rather than follow a person or design, TZM follows the self-generating premise of understanding and it hence operates in a non-centralized, holographic manner, with this train of thought as the origin of influence for action. Superstition to Science A notable pattern worth mentioning is how the evolution of mankind's understanding of itself and its habitat also continues to expand away from older ideas and perspectives, which are no longer supported due to the constant introduction of new, schema-altering information. A worthy notion to note here is superstition, which, in many circumstances, can be viewed as a category of belief that once appeared to be adequately supported by experience slash perception, but can no longer be held as viable due to new, conflicting data. For example, while traditional religious thought might seem increasingly implausible to more people today than ever in the West, due to the rapid growth in information and general literacy, the roots of religious thought can be traced to periods where humans could justify the validity and accuracy of such beliefs given the limited understanding they had of their environment in those early times. This pattern is apparent in all areas of understanding, including modern academia. Even so-called scientific conclusions that, again, with the advent of new information and updated tests often cannot be held as valid anymore, are still commonly defended due to their mere inclusion in the current cultural tradition. Such established institutions, as they could be called, often wish to maintain permanence due to reasons of ego, power, market income or general psychological comfort. This problem is, in many ways, at the core of our social paralysis. So, it is important to recognize this pattern of transition and realize how critical being vulnerable really is when it comes to belief systems, not to mention coming to terms with the rather dangerous phenomenon of established institutions which are culturally programmed and reinforced to seek self-preservation rather than evolve and change. Tradition to Emergence the perceptual clash between our cultural traditions and our ever-growing database of emergent knowledge is at the core of what defines the zeitgeist as we know it and a long-term review of history shows a slow grind out of superstitious cultural traditions and assumptions of reality as they heed to our newly realized benchmark of emergent, scientific causality. This is what TZM represents in its broadest philosophical context, a movement of the cultural zeitgeist itself into new, verifiable and more optimized understandings and applications. Hence, while society certainly has witnessed vast and accelerating changes in different areas of awareness and practice, such as with our vast material technology today, it appears our social system is still long behind. Political persuasion, market economics, labor for income, perpetual inequality, nation-states, legal assumptions and many other staples of our current social order continue to be largely accepted as normality by the current culture, with little more than their persistence through time as evidence of their value and empirical permanence. It is in this context that TZM finds its most broad imperative, changing the social system. Again, there are many problem-solving technical possibilities for personal and social progress today that continue to go unnoticed or misunderstood. The ending of war, the resolution of poverty, the creation of a material abundance unseen in history to meet human needs, the removal of most crime as we know it, the empowerment of true personal freedom through the removal of pointless and or monotonous labor, and the resolution of many environmental threats, are but a few of the calculated possibilities we have when we take our technical reality into account. However, again, these possibilities are not only largely unrecognized, they are also literally restricted by the current social order for the implementation of such problem-solving efficiency and prosperity stands in direct opposition to the very mechanics of how our current social system is operating at the core level. Therefore, until the socioeconomic tradition and its resulting social values are challenged and updated to present day understandings, until the majority of the human population understands the basic, underlying train of thought technically needed to support human sustainability in public health, as derived from the rigor of objective scientific investigation and validation, until much of the baggage of prior false assumptions, superstition, divisive loyalties and other socially unsustainable, Conflict generating, cultural hindrances are overcome all the life improving and problem resolving possibilities we now have at hand will remain largely dormant. The real revolution is the revolution of values. Human society appears centuries behind in the way it operates and hence what it values. If we wish to progress and solve the mounting problems at hand and, in effect, reverse what is an accelerating decline of our civilization in many ways, we need to change the way we think about ourselves and hence the world we inhabit. 
the Zeitgeist Movement's central task is to work to bring this value shift to light, unifying the human family with the basic perspective that we all share this small planet and we are all bound by the same natural order laws, as realized by the method of science. This common ground understanding extends much farther than many have understood in the past. The symbiosis of the human species and the synergistic relationship of our place in the physical world confirm that we are not separate entities in any respect. The new societal awakening must show a working social model that is arrived at from this inherent logic if we expect to survive and prosper in the long term. We can align or we can suffer. It is up to us. The Scientific Worldview Almost every major systematic error which has deluded men for thousands of years relied on practical experience. Horoscopes, incantations, oracles, magic, witchcraft, the cures of witch doctors and of medical practitioners before the advent of modern medicine were all firmly established through the centuries in the eyes of the public by their supposed practical successes. The scientific method was devised precisely for the purpose of elucidating the nature of things under more carefully controlled conditions and by more rigorous criteria than are present in the situations created by practical problems. Michael Polanyi Generally speaking, the evolution of human understanding can be seen as a move from surface observations, processed by our limited five physical senses, intuitively filtered through the educational framework and value characteristics of that period of time, to the technique of objective measuring and self-advancing methods of analysis which work to arrive at, or calculate, conclusions through testing and retesting proofs, seeking validation through the benchmark of scientific causality. A causality that appears to comprise the physical characteristics of what we call nature itself. The natural laws of our world exist whether we choose to recognize them or not. These inherent rules of our universe were around long before human beings evolved a comprehension to recognize them and while we can debate as to exactly how accurate our interpretation of these laws really is at this stage of our intellectual evolution, there is enough reinforcing evidence to show that we are, indeed, bound by static forces that have an inherent, measurable, determining logic. The vast developments and predictive integrity found in mathematics, physics, biology and other scientific disciplines proves that we as a species are slowly understanding the processes of nature and our growing, inventive capacity to emulate, accentuate or repress such natural processes confirms our progress in understanding it. The world around us today, overflowing with material technology and life-altering inventions, is a testament as to the integrity of the scientific process and what it is capable of. Unlike historical traditions, where a certain stasis exists with what people believe, as is still common in religious-type dogma today, this recognition of natural law includes characteristics which deeply challenge the assumed stability of beliefs which many hold sacred. As will be expanded upon later in this essay in the context of emergence, the fact is, there simply cannot exist a singular or static intellectual conclusion with respect to our perception and knowledge except, paradoxically, with regard to that very underlying pattern of uncertainty regarding such change and adaptation itself. This is part of what could be called a scientific worldview. It is one thing to isolate the techniques of scientific evaluation for select interests, such as the logic we might use in assessing and testing the structural integrity of a house design we might build, and another when the universal integrity of such physically rooted, causal reasoning and validation methods are applied to all aspects of our lives. Albert Einstein once said the further the spiritual evolution of mankind advances, the more certain it seems to me that the path to genuine religiosity does not lie through the fear of life and the fear of death and blind faith, but through striving after rational knowledge. While cynics of science often work to reduce its integrity to yet another form of religious faith, demean its accuracy as cold or without spirituality or even highlight consequences of applied technology for the worst, such as with the creation of the atomic bomb, which, in actuality, is an indication of a distortion of human values rather than engineering, there is no ignoring the incredible power this approach to understanding and harnessing reality has afforded the human race. No other ideology can come close in matching the predictive and utilitarian benefits this method of reasoning has provided. However, that is not to say active cultural denial of this relevance is not still widespread in the world today. For example, when it comes to theistic belief, there is often a divisive tendency that wishes to elevate the human being above such mere mechanics of the physical reality. 
The implied assumption here is usually that we humans are special for some reason and perhaps there are forces, such as an intervening god, that can override natural laws at will, making them less important than, say, ongoing obedience to God's wishes, etc. Sadly, there still exists a great human conceit in the culture which assumes, with no verifiable evidence, that humans are separate from all other phenomena and to consider ourselves connected or even a product of natural, scientific forces is to demean human life. Concurrently, there is also a tendency for what some call metamagical thinking, which could be considered a schizotypal kind of personality disorder where fantasy and mild delusion helps reinforce false assumptions of causality on the world, never harnessing the full rigor of the scientific method. Science requires testing and replication of a result for it to be validated and many beliefs of seemingly normal people today exist far outside this requirement. Apart from traditional religions, the cultural concept of New Age is also commonly associated with this type of superstitious thought. While it is extremely important that we as a society are aware of the uncertainty of our conclusions in general and hence must keep a creative, vulnerable state of mind to all postulations, the validation of those postulations can only come through measurable consistency, not wishful thinking or esoteric fascination. Such unvalidated ideas and assumptions pose a frame of reference that is often secured by faith not reason, and it is difficult to argue the merit of faith with anyone since the rules of faith inherently refuse argument itself. This is part of the quandary within which human society exists today, do we simply believe what we have been traditionally taught by our culture or do we question and test those beliefs against the physical reality around us to see if they hold true? Science is clearly concerned with the latter and holds nothing sacred, always ready to correct prior false conclusions when new information arises. To take such an inherently uncertain yet still extremely viable and productive approach to one's day-to-day -day view of the world requires a very different sensitivity, one that embodies vulnerability, not certainty. In the words of Professor Frank L. H. Wolf's Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Rochester, New York, it is often said in science that theories can never be proved, only disproved. There is always the possibility that a new observation or a new experiment will conflict with a long-standing theory. Emergence So, at the heart of the scientific method is skepticism and vulnerability. Science is interested in the closest approximation to the truth it can find and if there is anything science recognizes explicitly, it is that virtually everything we know will be revised over time as new information arises. Likewise, what might seem far-fetched, impossible or even superstitious upon its first culmination might very well prove to be a useful, viable understanding in the future once validated for integrity. The implication of this constitutes an emergence of thought, or even an emergence of truth, if you will. A cursory examination of history shows an ever-changing range of behaviors and practices based upon ever-updating knowledge and this humbling recognition is critical for human progress. Symbiosis A second point deeply characteristic of the scientific worldview worth bringing up in this regard has to do with the symbiotic nature of things, as we know them. Largely dismissed as common sense today by many, this understanding holds profound revelations for the way we think about our world, our beliefs, our conduct and ourselves. The term symbiotic is typically used in the context of interdependent relationships between biological species. However our context of the word is broader, relating to the interdependent relationship of everything. While early, intuitive views of natural phenomena might have looked upon, say, the manifestation of a tree as an independent entity, seemingly self-contained in its illusion of separation, the truth of the matter is that a tree's life is entirely dependent on seemingly external input forces for its very culmination and existence. The water, sunlight, nutrients and other needed interactive external attributes to facilitate the development of a tree is an example of a symbiotic or synergetic relationship. However, the scope of this symbiosis has become much more revealing than we have ever known in the past and it appears the more we learn about the dynamics of our universe, the more immutable its interdependence. The best concept to embody this notion is that of a system. The term tree is really a reference to a perceived system. The root, trunk, branches, leaves and other such attributes of that tree could be called subsystems. Yet, the tree itself is also a subsystem, it could be said, of, perhaps, a forest, which itself is a subsystem of other larger, encompassing phenomena such as an ecosystem.
Such distinctions might seem trivial to many but the fact is, a great failure in human awareness has been not to fully respect the scope of the Earth system and how each subsystem plays a relevant role. The term categorical systems could even be used here to describe all systems, seemingly small or large, because such language distinctions are ultimately arbitrary. These perceived systems and the words used to reference them are simply human conveniences for communication. The fact is, there appears to be only one possible system, as organized by natural law, which can be legitimately referenced since all the systems we perceive and categorize today can only be subsystems. We simply cannot find a truly closed system anywhere. Even the Earth system, which intuitively appears autonomous, with the Earth floating about the void of space, is entirely reliant on the Sun, the Moon and likely many, many other symbiotic-slash-synergistic factors we have yet to even understand for its defining characteristics. In other words, when we consider the interactions that link these perceived categorical systems together, we find a connection of everything and, on a societal level, this system interaction understanding is at the foundation of likely the most viable perspective for true human sustainability. The human being, like a tree or the earth, again intuitively appears self-contained. Yet, without, for example, oxygen to breathe, one will not survive. This means the human system requires interaction with an atmospheric system and hence a system of oxygen production, and since the process of photosynthesis accounts for the majority of the atmospheric oxygen we breathe, it is to our advantage to be aware of what affects this particular system and work to harmonize our social practices with it. When we witness, say, pollution of the oceans or the rapid deforestation of Earth, we often forget how important such phenomena really are to the integrity of the human system. In fact, there are so many examples of environmental disturbances perpetuated by our species today due to a truncated awareness of this symbiotic cause and effect that links all known categorical systems, volumes, could be dedicated to the crisis. At any rate, the failure to recognize this connectedness is a fundamental problem and once this principle of interacting systems is fully understood, many of our most common practices today will likely appear grossly ignorant and dangerous in future hindsight. Sustainable Beliefs this brings us to the level of thought and understanding itself. As noted prior, the very language system we use isolates and organizes elements of our world for general comprehension. Language itself is a system based upon categorical distinctions, which we associate to our perceived reality. However, as needed as such a mode of identification and organization is to the human mind, it also inherently implies false division. Given that foundation, it is easy to speculate as to how we have grown so accustomed to thinking and acting in inherently divisive ways and why the history of human society has been a history of imbalance and conflict. It is on this level that such physical systems we have discussed come into relevance with belief and thought systems. While the notion of sustainability might be typically associated with technical processes, eco-theory and engineering today, we often forget that our values and beliefs precede all such technical applications. Therefore, we need our cultural orientation to be sustainable to begin with and that awareness can only come from a valid recognition of the laws of nature to which we are bound. Can we measure the integrity of a belief system? Yes. We can measure it by how well its principles align with scientific causality, based upon the feedback resulting. If we were to compare outcomes of differing belief systems seeking a common end, how well those perspectives accomplish this end can be measured and hence these systems can then be qualified and ranked against each other as to their merit or lack thereof. As will be explored in detail later in this work, the central belief system comparison here is between the market economy and the aforementioned natural law slash resource-based economy. At the core of these systems is essentially a conflicting belief about causality and possibility and the reader is challenged to make objective judgments about how well each perspective may accomplish certain common end human goals. That noted and in the context of this essay, specifically the points about emergence and symbiosis, it could be generalized that any belief system that, a, does not have built into it the allowance for that entire belief system itself to be altered or even made completely obsolete due to new information, is an unsustainable belief system, and, b, any belief system that supports isolation and division, supporting the integrity of one segment or group over another is also an unsustainable belief system. 
Sociologically, having a scientific worldview means being willing and able to adapt both as an individual and as a civilization when new understandings and approaches emerge that can better solve problems and further prosperity. This worldview likely marks the greatest shift in human comprehension in history. Every modern convenience we take for granted is a result of this method whether recognized or not, as the inherent, self-generating, mechanistic logic appears to be universally applicable to all known phenomena. While many in the world still attribute causality to gods, demons, spirits and other non-measurable faith-based views, a new period of reason appears to be on the horizon where the emerging scientific understanding of ourselves and our habitat is challenging the traditional, established frameworks we have inherited from our less informed ancestors. No longer is the technical orientation of science demeaned to mere gadgets and tools. The true message of this worldview is about the very philosophy by which we need to orient our lives, values and social institutions. So, as will be argued in further essays, the social system, its economic premise, along with its legal and political structure, has become arguably linked to a condition of faith in the manner it is now perpetuated. The market and monetary-driven system of economy, for example, is argued to be based on little more than a set of now outdated, increasingly inefficient assumptions, no different than how early humans falsely assumed the world was flat, demons caused sickness, or that the constellations in the sky were fixed, static, two-dimensional, tapestry-like constructs. There are enormous parallels to be found with traditional religious faith and the established, cultural institutions we assume to be valid and normal today. Just as the Church in the Middle Ages held absolute power in Europe, promoting loyalties and rituals which most would find absurd or even insane today, those a number of generations from now will likely look back at the established practices of our current time and think the exact same thing. Sourcing Solutions A new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move toward higher levels. Albert Einstein a central consideration inherent to TZM's perspective on societal change for the better regards understanding progress itself. There appear to be two basic angles to consider when it comes to personal or social progress, manifesting potential and problem resolution. Potential and resolution. Manifesting potential is simply the improvement of a condition that was not considered prior to be in a problematic state. An example would be the ability to improve human athletic performance in a particular field through targeted strengthening, diet, refining techniques and other means that were simply not known before. Problem resolution, on the other hand, is the overcoming of an issue that has currently recognized detrimental consequences and or limitations to a given affair. A general example would be the discovery of a medical cure for an existing, debilitating disease so that said disease no longer poses harm. However, taken in the broad view, there is a distinct overlap with these two notions when the nature of knowledge development is taken into account. For example, an improvement to a given condition, a practice that then becomes normalized and common in the culture, can also potentially be part of a problem in a familiar or different context, which requires resolution in the event new information as to its inefficiency is found or new advancements make it obsolete by comparison. For example, human air transportation, which is fairly new in society, expanded transport efficiency greatly upon its application. However, at what point will modern air transport be seen more as a problem due to its inefficiency by comparison to another method? So, efficiency is relative in this sense as only when there is an expansion of knowledge that what was once considered the best approach becomes inferior. This seemingly abstract point is brought up to communicate the simple fact that every single practice we consider normal today has built into it an inevitable inefficiency which, upon new developments in science and technology, will likely produce a problem at some point in the future when compared to newer, emerging potentials. This is the nature of change and if the scientific patterns of history reflect anything, it is that knowledge and its applications continue to evolve and improve, generally speaking. So, back to the seemingly separate issues of manifesting potential and problem resolution, it can hence be deduced that all problem resolutions are also acts of manifesting potential and vice versa. This also means that the actual tools used by society for a given purpose are always transient. Whether it is a medium of transportation, medical practices, energy production, the social system itself, etc. 
These practices are all manifest slash resolutions with respect to human necessity and efficiency, based upon the ever-changing state of understanding we have or had at the time of their creation slash evolution. Root Purpose and Root Cause Therefore, when it comes to thinking about any act of invention or problem-solving, we must get as close to the root purpose, manifest, or the root cause, problem, as possible, respectively, to make the most accurate assessment for action. Just as tools and techniques for potential are only as viable as the understanding of their foundational purpose, actions toward problem resolution are only as good as the understanding of the root cause. This might seem obvious, but this awareness is often missing in many areas of thought in the world today, especially when it comes to society. Rather than pursuing such a focus, most social decisions are based around traditional customs that have inherent limits. A simple example of this is the current method of human incarceration for so-called criminal behavior. For many, the solution to offensive forms of human behavior is to simply remove the individual from society and punish them. This is based on a series of assumptions that stretch back millennia. Yet, the science behind human behavior has changed tremendously with respect to understanding causality. It is now common knowledge in the social sciences that most acts of crime would likely not occur if certain basic, supportive environmental conditions were set for the human being. Putting people in prisons is not actually resolving anything with respect to the causal problem. It is more of a mere patch, if you will, which only temporarily stifles some effects of the larger problem. Another example, while seemingly different than the prior but equally as technical, is the manner by which most think about solutions to common domestic problems, such as traffic accidents. What is the solution to a situation where a driver makes a mistake and haphazardly changes lanes, only to impact the vehicle next to it, causing an accident? Should there be a huge wall between them? Should there be better training? Should the person simply have his or her driver's license revoked so they cannot drive again? It is here, again, where the notion of root cause is often lost in the narrow frames of reference commonly understood by culture. The root cause of the accident can only partially be the question of integrity of the driver with the more important issue being the lack of integrity of the technology and infrastructure being used. Why? Because, in part, human fallibility is historically acknowledged and immutable. So, just as early vehicles did not have driver and or passenger side airbags common today, which now reduce a large number of injuries that existed in the past, the same logic should be applied to the system of vehicle interaction itself, taking into account new technical possibilities for increased safety, to compensate for inevitable human error. Just as the airbag was developed years ago, as the evolution of knowledge unfolded, today there is technology that enables automated, driverless vehicles which can not only detect every necessary element of the street needed to operate with accuracy, the vehicles themselves can detect each other, making collision almost impossible. This is the current state of such a solution when we consider the root cause and root purpose, overall. Yet, as advanced as that solution may seem, especially given the roughly 1.2 million people who unnecessarily die in automobile accidents each year, this thought exercise may still be incomplete if we continue to extend the context with respect to the core goals. Perhaps there are other inefficiencies that relate to the transport infrastructure and beyond that need to be taken into account and overcome. Perhaps, for example, the use of individual automobiles, regardless of their safety, has other inherent problems that can only be logically resolved by the removal of the automobile application itself. Perhaps in a city, with an expanding mobile population, such independent vehicle transport becomes unnecessarily cumbersome, slow and generally inefficient. The more viable solution in this circumstance might become the need for a unified, integrated mass transit system that can increase speed, reduce energy use, reduce resource use, and reduce pollution along with many other related issues to the effect that using automobiles in such a condition then becomes part of an emerging problem. If the goal of a society is to do the correct and hence sustainable thing, reducing threats to humans and the habitat, ever-increasing efficiency, a dynamic, self-generating logic unfolds with respect to our technical possibility in design approaches. Our technical reality. Of course, the application of this type of problem-solving is far from limited to such physical examples. Is politics as we know it the best means to address our social woes? Does it address root causes by its very design? 
Is money and the market system the most optimized method for sustainable progress, problem resolution and the manifesting of economic potential? What does our modern state of science and technology have to contribute in the realm of understanding cause and purpose on the societal level? As further essays will denote in great detail, these understandings create a natural, clear train of thought with respect to how much better our world could be if we simply follow the logic created via the scientific method of thought to fulfill our common goal of human sustainability. The one billion people starving on this planet are not doing so because of some immutable natural consequence of our physical reality. There is plenty of food to go around. It is the social system, which has its own outdated, contrived logic, that perpetuates this social atrocity, along with countless others. It is important to point out that TZM is not concerned with promoting patches as its ultimate goal, which, sad to say, is what the vast majority of activist institutions on the planet are currently doing. We want to promote the largest order, highest efficiency set of solutions available at a given time, aligned with natural processes, to improve the lives of all, while securing the integrity of our habitat. We want everyone to understand this train of thought clearly and develop a value identification with it. In the end, there is no single solution, only the near-empirical natural law reasoning that arrives at solutions and purpose. Logic versus Psychology we do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have those because we have acted rightly. Aristotle A powerful yet often overlooked consequence of our environmental vulnerability to adapt to the existing culture is that our very identity and personality is often linked to the institutions, practices, trends and hence values we are born into and exist in. This psychological adaptation and inevitable familiarity creates a comfort zone which, over time, can be painful to disrupt, regardless of how well reasoned the data standing to the contrary of what we believe may be. In fact, the vast majority of objections currently found against the Zeitgeist movement, specifically points made with respect to solutions and hence change, appear to be driven by narrow frames of reference and emotional bias more than intellectual assessment. Common reactions of this kind are often singular propositions that, rather than critically addressing the actual premises articulated by an argument, serve to dismiss them outright via haphazard associations. The most common classification of such arguments are projections and it becomes clear very often that such opponents are actually more concerned with defending their psychological identity rather than objectively considering a new perspective. Mind Lock in a classic work by authors Cohen and Nagel titled An Introduction to Logic and the Scientific Method, this point is well made with respect to the process of logical evaluation and its independence from human psychology. The weight of evidence is not itself a temporal event, but a relation of implication between certain classes or types of propositions, of course, thought is necessary to apprehend such implications, however that does not make physics a branch of psychology. The realization that logic cannot be restricted to psychological phenomenon will help us to discriminate between our science and rhetoric, conceiving the latter as the art of persuasion or of arguing so as to produce the feeling of certainty. Our emotional dispositions make it very difficult for us to accept certain propositions, no matter how strong the evidence in their favor. And since all proof depends upon the acceptance of certain propositions as true, no proposition can be proved to be true to one who is sufficiently determined not to believe it. The term mind lock has been coined by some philosophers with respect to this phenomenon, defined as the condition where one's perspective becomes self referring, in a closed loop of reasoning. Seemingly empirical presuppositions frame and secure one's worldview, and anything contradictory coming from the outside can be blocked or rejected, often even subconsciously. This reaction could be likened to the common physical reflex to protect oneself from a foreign object moving towards your person, only in this circumstance the reflex is to defend one's beliefs, not body. While such phrases as thinking outside the box might be common rhetoric today in the activist community, seldom are the foundations of our way of thinking and the integrity of our most established institutions challenged. They are, more often than not, considered to be givens and assumed inalterable. For example, in the so-called democracies of the world, a president, or the equivalent, is a common point of focus with respect to the quality of a country's governance. A large amount of attention is spent towards such a figure, his perspectives and actions. Yet, seldom does one step back and ask, why do we have a president to begin with? 
How is his, her power as an institutional figure justified as an optimized manner of social governance? Is it not a contradiction of terms to claim a democratic society when the public has virtually no real say with respect to the actions of the president once he or she is elected? Such questions are seldom considered as people tend, again, to adapt to their culture without objection, assuming it is just the way it is. Such static orientations are almost universally a result of cultural tradition and, as Cohen and Nagel point out, it is very difficult to communicate a new, challenging idea to those who are sufficiently determined not to believe it. Such traditional presuppositions, held as empirical, are likely a root source of personal and social retardation in the world today. This phenomenon, coupled with an educational system that constantly reinforces such established notions through its institutions of academia, further seals this cultural inhibition and compounds the hindrance to relevant change. While the scope of this tendency is wide with respect to debate, there are two common argumentative fallacies worth noting here as they constantly come up with respect to the application set and train of thought promoted by TZM. Put in colorful terms, these tactics comprise what could be called a value war, which is waged, consciously or not, by those who have vested emotional-slash-material interest in keeping things the same, opposing change. The Prima Facie Fallacy the first is the prima facie association. This simply means upon first appearance, before investigation. This is by far the most common type of objection. A classical case study is the common claim that the observations and solutions presented by TZM are simply rehashed Marxist communism. Let's briefly explore this as an example. Referencing the Communist Manifesto Marx and Engels present various observations with respect to the evolution of society, specifically class war, inherent structural relationships regarding capital, along with a general logic as to how the social order will transition through revolution to a stateless, classless system, in part, while also noting a series of direct social changes, such as the centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. Equal liability of all to labor, and other specifics. Marx creates players in the schema he suggests like the ongoing battle between the bourgeoisie and proletarians, expressing contempt for the inherent exploitation, which he says is essentially rooted in the idea of private property. In the end, the accumulated goal in general is in seeking a stateless and classless society. On the surface, reformations proposed in TZM's promoted solutions might appear to mirror attributes of Marxism if one was to completely ignore the underlying reasoning. The idea of a society without classes, without universal property, and the complete redefinition of what comprises the state might, on the surface, show confluence by the mere gestures themselves, especially since Western academia commonly promotes a duality between communism and capitalism with the aforementioned character points noted as the core differences. However, the actual train of thought to support these seemingly similar conclusions is quite different. TZM's advocated benchmark for decision-making is not a moral philosophy, which, when examined at its road, is essentially what Marxist philosophy was a manifestation of. TZM is not interested in the poetic, subjective and arbitrary notions of a fair society, guaranteed freedom, world peace, or making a better world simply because it sounds right, humane or good. Without a technical framework that has a direct physical referent to such terms, such moral relativism serves little to no long-term purpose. Rather, TZM is interested in scientific application, as applied to societal sustainability, both physical and cultural. As will be expressed in greater detail in further essays, the method of science is not restricted in its application within the physical world and hence the social system, infrastructure, educational relevance and even understanding human behavior itself, all exist within the confines of scientific causality. In turn, there is a natural feedback system built into physical reality which will express itself very clearly in the context of what works and what doesn't over time, guiding our conscious adaptation. Marxism is not based on this calculated worldview at all, even though their TZM is not interested in the poetic, subjective and arbitrary notions of a fair society, guaranteed freedom, world peace, or making a better world simply because it sounds right, humane or good. Without a technical framework that has a direct physical referent to such terms, such moral relativism serves little to no long-term purpose. 
Rather, TZM is interested in scientific application, as applied to societal sustainability, both physical and cultural. As will be expressed in greater detail in further essays, the method of science is not restricted in its application within the physical world and hence the social system, infrastructure, educational relevance and even understanding human behavior itself, all exist within the confines of scientific causality. In turn, there is a natural feedback system built into physical reality which will express itself very clearly in the context of what works and what doesn't over time, guiding our conscious adaptation. Marxism is not based on this calculated worldview at all, even though there might be some scientifically based characteristics inherent. For example, the Marxist notion of a classless society was to overcome the capitalist originating in humanity imposed on the working class or proletariat. TZM's advocated train of thought, on the other hand, sources advancements in human studies. It finds, for example, that social stratification, which is inherent to the capitalist slash market model, to actually be a form of indirect violence against the vast majority as a result of the evolutionary psychology we humans naturally posses. It generates an unnecessary form of human suffering on many levels, which is destabilizing and, by implication, technically unsustainable. Another example is TZM's interest in removing universal property and setting up a system of shared access. This is often quickly condemned to the Marxist idea of abolishing private property. However, generally speaking, the Marxist logic relates the existence of private property to the perpetuation of the bourgeois and their ongoing exploitation of the proletariat. He states in the manifesto, the distinguishing feature of communism is not the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeois property. TZM's advocated logic, on the other hand, relates the fact that the practice of universal, individual ownership of goods is environmentally inefficient, wasteful, and ultimately unsustainable as a practice. This supports a restrictive system behavior and a great deal of unnecessary deprivation, and hence crime is common in societies with an unequal distribution of resources. At any rate, such prima facie allegations are very common and many more could be expressed. However, it is not the scope of this section to discuss all alleged connections between Marxism and TZM's advocated train of thought. In the end, the debate is essentially pointless as to argue such a correlation is to simply ignore the true purpose and merit of the societal conception itself. The straw man fallacy. The second argumentative fallacy has to do with the misrepresentation of a position, deliberate or projected, commonly referred to as a straw man. When it comes to TZM, this usually has to do with imposed interpretations that are without legitimate evidence to be considered relevant to a point in question. For example, when discussing the organization of a new social system, people often project their current values and concerns into the new model without considering the vast change of context inherent which would likely nullify such concerns immediately. A common strawman projection in this context would be that in a society where material production were based upon technological application directly and not an exchange system requiring paid human labor, people would have no incentive to do anything and therefore the model would fail as nothing would get done. This kind of argument is without testable validity with respect to the human sciences and is really an intuitive assumption originating from the current cultural climate where the economic system coerces all humans into labor roles for survival, income slash profit. This often occurs regardless of one's personal interest or social utility, often generating a psychological distortion with respect to motivation. In the words of Margaret Mead, if you look closely you will see that almost anything that really matters to us, anything that embodies our deepest commitment to the way human life should be lived and cared for, depends on some form of volunteerism. In a 1992 Gallup poll, more than 50% of American adults, 94 million Americans, volunteered time for social causes, at an average of 4.2 hours a week, for a total of 20.5 billion hours a year. It has also been found in studies that repetitive, mundane jobs lend themselves more to traditional rewards such as money, whereas money doesn't seem to motivate innovation and creativity. In later essays, the idea of mechanization slash automation applied to mundane labor to free the human being will be discussed, expressing how the labor for income system is outdated and restrictive of not only industrial potential and efficiency, but also human potential and creativity overall. Another common, contextual example of a straw man is the claim that if the transition to a new social system was acted upon, 
the property of others must be forcefully confiscated by a ruling power and violence would be the result. This, once again, is a value projection slash fear imposed upon TZM's advocated logic without validation. TZM sees the materialization of a new socioeconomic model happening with the needed consensus of the population. Its very understanding, along with the biosocial pressures occurring as the current system worsens, is the basis of influence. The logic does not support a dictatorial disposition because that approach, apart from being inhumane, wouldn't work. In order for such a system to work, it needs to be accepted without active state coercion. Therefore, it is an issue of investigation, education, and broad personal acceptance in the community. In fact, the very specifics of social interaction and lifestyle actually demand a vast majority acceptance of the system's mechanics and values. Similarly, and final example here of the straw man, is the confusion about how a transition to a new system could happen at all. In fact, many tend to dismiss TZM's proposals on that basis alone, simply because they don't understand how it can happen. This argument, in principle, is the same reasoning as the example of a sick man who is seeking treatment for his illness, but does not know where he can get such treatment, when it would be available, or what the treatment is. Does his lack of knowing how and when stop his need to seek? No, not if he wants to be healthy. Given the dire state of affairs on this planet, humanity must also keep seeking and a path will inevitably come clear. In the end, it is worth reiterating that the battle between logic and psychology is really a central conflict in the arena of societal change. There is no context more personal and sensitive than the way we organize our lives in society and an important objective of TZM, in many ways, is to find techniques that can educate the public as to the merit of this logical train of thought, overcoming the baggage of outdated psychological comforts which serve no progressive, viable value role in the modern world. The Case for Human Unity My country is the world, and my religion is to do good. Thomas Paine a critical conclusion present in the logic that defines TZM's intention is that human society needs to unify its economic operations and work to align with the natural dynamics of the physical world as a single species sharing one habitat if we intend to resolve existing problems, increase safety, increase efficiency and further prosperity. The world economic divisions we see today are not only a clear source of conflict, destabilization and exploitation, the very manner of conduct and interaction itself is also grossly inefficient in a pure economic sense, severely limiting our societal potential. While the nation-state, competition-based structure is easy to justify as a natural outgrowth of our cultural evolution given the resource scarcity inherent historically and the long history of warfare in general. It is also natural to consider that human society could very well find purpose in moving away from these modes of operation if we were to realize that it is truly to our advantage as a whole group. As will be argued here, the detriments and inefficiencies of the current model, when compared to the benefits and solutions possible, are simply unacceptable. The efficiency and abundance possibilities, extrapolated within TZM's intention to install a new socioeconomic system, rest, in part, on a concerted effort by the human population to work together and share resources intelligently, not restrict and fight as we do today. Moreover, the social pressures and risks now emerging today around technological warfare, pollution, environmental destabilization and other problems not only express a deeply needed gravitation for true global organization, they show a rational necessity. The xenophobic and mafia-like mentality indigenous to the nation-state today, often in the form of patriotism, is a source of severe destabilization and inhumanity in general, not to mention, again, a substantial loss of technical efficiency. False divisions. As noted in prior essays, the core basis of our survival and quality of life as individuals and as a species on the earth revolves around our understanding of natural law and how it relates to our method of economy. This premise is a simple referential understanding where the physical laws of nature are considered in the context of economic efficiency, both on the human and habitat levels. It is only logical that any species present in and reliant on the habitat in which it exists should conform all conduct to align with the natural orders inherent to that habitat, as best they can be understood at the time. Any other orientation is simply irrational and can only lead to problems.
Understanding that Earth is a symbiotic-slash-synergistic system with resources existing in all areas, coupled with the provably inherent underlying causal scientific order that exists, in many ways, as a logical guide for the human species to align with for the greatest societal efficacy, we find that our larger context as a global society transcends all notions of traditional-slash-cultural division, including having no loyalty to a country, corporation or even political tradition. If an economy is about increasing efficiency in meeting the needs of the human population while working to further sustainability and prosperity, then our economic operations must take this into account and align with the largest relevant system that we can understand. So again, from this perspective, the nation-state entities are clearly false, arbitrary divisions, perpetuated by cultural tradition, not logical, technical efficiency. Values the broad organization of society today is based on multi-level human competition. Nation-states compete against each other for economic-slash-physical resources, corporate market entities compete for profit-slash-market share, and average workers compete for wage providing occupations-slash-income and hence personal survival itself. Within this competitive ethic is a basic psychological propensity to disregard the well-being of others and the habitat. The very nature of competition is about having advantage over others for personal gain and hence, needless to say, division and exploitation are common attributes of the current social order. Interestingly, virtually all so-called corruption which we may define as crime in the world today is based upon the very same mentality assumed to guide progress in the world through the competitive interest. It is no wonder, in fact, given this framework, that various other detrimental, superficial social divisions are still pervasive such as race, religion, creed, class or xenophobic bias. This divisive baggage from early, fear-oriented stages of our cultural evolution simply has no working basis in the physical reality and serves now only to hinder progress, safety and sustainability. Today, as will be described in later essays, the possible efficiency and abundance-producing methods that could remove most all human deprivation, increase the average standard of living enormously in perfect public health and ecological sustainability greatly, go unembraced due to the older social traditions in place, including the nation-state idea. The fact is, there is technically only one race, the human race, there is only one basic habitat, Earth, and there is only one working manner of operational thought, scientific. Origins and Influence Let's quickly consider the root origins of the competitive-slash-divisive model. Without going into too much detail, it is clear that the evolution of society has included a vast history of conflict, scarcity and imbalance. While there is debate as to the nature of society during the period of time preceding the Neolithic Revolution, the Earth since that time has been a battlefield where countless lives have been taken for the sake of competition, whether material or ideological. This recognized pattern is so pervasive in fact that many today attribute the propensity for conflict and domination to an irreconcilable, impulsive characteristic of our human nature with the conclusion that the human being is simply unable to operate in a social system that is not based upon this competitive framework and any such attempt will create vulnerability that will be exploited by power abuse, expressing this apparent competitive slash dominance trait. While the subject of human nature itself is not the direct focus of this essay, let it be stated that the empirical power abuse assumption has been a large part of the defense of the competitive-slash-divisive model, using a general broad view of history as its basis for validity. However, the specifics of the conditions in those periods, coupled with the known flexibility of the human being, are often disregarded or ignored in these assessments. The historical pattern of conflict cannot be considered in mere isolation. Detailed reference to the conditions and circumstances are needed. In fact, it's likely accurate to say that the dominant-slash-conflict propensity, which is clearly a possible reaction for nearly all humans in our need for self-preservation and survival in general is being provoked by pressures rather than being the source of any negative reaction. When we wonder how the massive Nazi army were able to morally justify their actions in World War II, we often forget the enormous propaganda campaign put out by that regime which worked to exploit this essentially biological vulnerability. True self-interest The notion of self-interest is clearly inherent to the human being's common urge to survive. This is obvious enough and it is easy to see historically how the raw necessity of personal survival, often extending to family and then the tribe, community, set the stage for the divisive, protectionist paradigm we exist in today. 
It should have been expected from the standpoint of history that vast economic theories would also be based upon the notion of competition and inequality, such as in the work of Adam Smith. Considered the father of the free market, he made popular the assumption that if everyone had the ethic to look out for themselves only, the world would progress as a community. This invisible hand notion of human progress arising from narrow personal self-interest alone might have been a semi-workable philosophy many years ago when the simplicity of the society itself was based on everyone being something of a producer. However, the nature of society has changed greatly over time, with population increases, entirely different role structures and exponentially advancing technology. The risks associated with this manner of thought are now proving to be more dangerous than beneficial, and the true definition of self-interest is taking a larger context than ever before. Is it not in your self-interest to protect and nourish the habitat that supports you? Is it not in your self-interest to take care of society as a whole? providing for its members so that the consequences of deprivation, such as crime are reduced as much as possible to ensure your safety? Is it not self-interest to consider the consequences of imperialist wars that can breed fierce jingoistic hatred on one side of the planet, only to have, say, a suitcase bomb explode behind you at a restaurant as a desperate blowback act of retribution? Is it not self-interest to assure all of society's children have the best upbringing and education so that your future and the future of your children can exist in a responsible, educated, and increasingly productive world? Is it not in your self-interest to make sure industry is as organized, optimized and scientifically accurate as possible, so that we do not produce shoddy, cheap technology that might perhaps cause a problem in the future if it fails? The bottom line is that things have changed in the world today and your self-interest is now only as good as your societal interest. Being competitive and going out for yourself, beating others only has a negative consequence in the long term, for it is denying awareness of the synergistic system we are bound within. A cheaply made nuclear power plant in Japan might not mean much to people in America. However, if that plant was to have a large-scale technical failure, the fallout and pollution might make its way over to American homes proving that you are never safe in the long run unless you have a global consciousness. In the end, only an earth humankind conscious view can assure a person's true self-interest and hence, in many ways, also assure our society's evolutionary fitness. The very idea of wishing to support your country and ignoring or even enjoying the failure of others is a destabilizing value system. Warfare The days of practical warfare are long over. New technology on the horizon has the ability to create weapons that will make the atom bomb look like a Roman catapult in destructive power. Centuries ago, warfare could at least be minimized to the warring parties overall. Today, the entire world is threatened. There are over 23,000 nuclear weapons today, which could wipe out the human population many times over. In many ways, our very social maturity is being questioned at this time. Battles with only sticks and stones as weapons could tolerate a great deal of human distortion and malicious intent. However, in a world of nanotech weapons that could be constructed in a small lab with enormous destructive power, our expanded self-interest needs to take hold and the institution of war needs to be systematically shut down. In order to do this, nations must technically unify and share their resources and ideas, not hoard them for competitive self-betterment, which is the norm today. Institutions like the United Nations have become complete failures in this regard because they naturally become tools of empire building due to the underlying nature of country divisions and the socioeconomic dominance of the property slash monetary slash competition based system orientation. It is not enough to simply gather global leaders at a table to discuss their problems. The structure itself needs to change to support a different type of interaction between these regional groups where the perpetual threat inherent between nation-states is removed. In the end, there is no empirical ownership of resources or ideas. Just as all ideas are serially developed across culture through the group mind, the resources of the planet are equally as transient in their function and scientifically defined as to their possible purposes. The Earth is a single system, along with the laws of nature that govern it. Either human society recognizes and begins to act and organize on this inherent logic, or we suffer in the long run. The Final Argument, Human Nature 
man acquires at birth, through heredity, a biological constitution which we must consider fixed and unalterable, including the natural urges, which are characteristic of the human species. In addition, during his lifetime, he acquires a cultural constitution which he adopts from society through communication and through many other types of influences. It is this cultural constitution which, with the passage of time, is subject to change and which determines to a very large extent the relationship between the individual and society. Albert Einstein The only argument remaining The train of thought and application set presented in TZM's materials are technical by nature, expressing the interest of applying the method and merit of scientific causality to the social system as a whole. The benefits of this approach are not only to be taken on their own merit but should also be considered in contrast to today's established, traditional methods and their consequences. It will likely then be noticed that our current societal methods are not only grossly outdated and inefficient by comparison, they are increasingly dangerous and inhumane with the necessity for large-scale social change becoming ever more important. This isn't about utopia. It is about truly practical improvements. The overall basis of the market concept has to do fundamentally with assumptions related to human behavior, traditional values and an intuitive view of history, not emergent reasoning, actual public health measures, technical capacity or ecological responsibility. It is a non-technical, philosophical approach, which merely assumes that human decisions made through its internal logic and incentive system, will produce a responsible, sustainable and humane outcome, driven by the elusive notion of freedom of choice which, on the scale of societal functionality, appears tantamount to organizational anarchy. This is why the monetary market model of economics is often considered religious by nature in TZM materials as the causal mechanism is really based on virtually superstitious assumptions of the human condition with little linkage to emerging scientific understandings about ourselves and the rigid symbiotic-slash-synergistic relationship of our habitat and its governing natural laws. When presenting TZM's solution-oriented train of thought to those unfamiliar, it is usually just a matter of time before, at a minimum, the basic scientific premise is understood and accepted in abstraction. For example, the isolated technical reality that we have the resources and industrial methods to easily feed everyone on the planet Earth, so no one has to starve, rarely finds argument in and of itself. If you were to ask an average person today if they would like to see an end to the over 1 billion people in currently in chronic starvation on the planet, they would most likely agree. However, it is when the logic runs its course and starts to depict the type of large-scale social and economic reformations needed to facilitate true system support for those 1 plus billion people that many find contempt and objection. Apart from stubborn, temporal value associations, where people essentially refuse to change anything they have become used to in their lives, even if that change clearly supports a better outcome in the long term, there is one argument so common that it warrants a preliminary discussion in and of itself. That is the argument of human nature. This argument might also be said to be the only real objection left, if you think about it, outside again of the near-arbitrary cultural lifestyle practices people are afraid to change due to their identity associations and conditioned comforts. Are humans compatible with a truly sustainable, scientific socioeconomic system or are we doomed to the world we have now due to our genetics? Everything is technical. The case for a new social system based directly on a scientific view for understanding and maximizing sustainability and prosperity, technically, really cannot be contradicted by another approach, as bold as such a statement may seem. Why? Because there simply isn't one when the unifying, natural law logic of the scientific method is accepted as the root mechanism of physical causality and it For example, great surface variation, ornament, might exist with the design of an airplane, but the mechanics which enable flight are bound by physical laws and hence so must the overall physical design of the airplane in order to function properly. Constructing such a machine to perform a job with the goal of optimized performance, safety and efficiency is not a matter of opinion, just as no matter how many ornaments we may place around our homes, the physical structure of the building must adhere to the rigid laws of physics and natural dynamics of the habitat for safety and endurance and hence can have little respective variation in a technical sense. The organization of human society can be no different if the intention is integrity and optimization. To think of the functional nature of a working society is to think about a mechanistic schematic, if you will. Just as we would design an airplane to work in the best way possible, 
technically, so should our approach be to the social system, which is equally as technical in its needed functionality. Unfortunately, this general perspective has never been given a real chance in history and today our world is still run in an incongruous manner where the principal incentive is more about detached, immediate, short-sighted personal gain and differential advantage than it is about proper, strategic industrial methods, ecological alignment, social stability, public health considerations and generational sustainability. This is all pointed out, again, because the human nature argument against such an approach is really the only seemingly technical argument that can possibly defend the old system we have today. It is really the only argument left when people who wish to uphold this system realize that nothing else they logically argue can possibly be viable given the irrationality inherent to every other claim against a natural law-based social model. Irrationally bound? Boiling it down, this challenge can be considered in one question, is the human species able to adapt and thrive in a technically organized system where our values and practices align with the known laws of nature in practice, or are we confined by our genes, biology and evolutionary psychology to operate in only the way we know today? While many today argue the specifics of the nature versus nurture debate from blank slate behaviorism to genetic determinism it has become clear, at a minimum, that our biology, our psychology and our sociological condition are inexorably linked to the environment we inhabit, both from the standpoint of generational evolutionary adaptation, biological evolution, to short-term biases and values we absorb from our environment, cultural evolution. So, before we go into detail on this issue, it is well worth noting that our very definition as human beings in the long and short-term view is based upon a process of adaptation to existing conditions, including the genes themselves. This is not to discount the per-case genetic relevance itself, but to highlight the process to which we are a part, for the gene-environment relationship can only be considered as an ongoing interaction, with the outcomes largely a result of the environmental conditions in the long and short term. If this wasn't the case, there is little doubt the human species would have likely perished long ago due to a failure to adapt. Moreover, while it is clear we humans still appear to maintain hardwired, predictable reactions for raw, personal survival, we have also proven the ability to evolve our behaviors through thought, awareness and education, allowing us to, in fact, control-slash-overcome those impulsive, primitive reactions, if the conditions for such are supported and reinforced. This is an extremely important distinction and is what separates the variants of human beings from their less revolved primate family, in many ways. A quick glance at the diversity in historical human conduct we see throughout time, contrasted with the relatively slow pace of larger structural changes of our brains and DNA over the past couple of thousand years, shows that our adaptive capacity, via thought slash education, is enormous on the cultural level. It appears that we are capable of many possible behaviors and that a fixed human nature, as an unalterable, universal set of behavioral traits slash reactions shared by all humans without exception cannot be held as valid. Rather, there appears to be a spectrum of possible behaviors and predictable reactions, all more or less contingent upon the type of development, education, stimuli and conditions we experience. The social imperative in this respect cannot be emphasized enough for environmental influence is a massive factor that grooms not only our decision-making preferences in both the long and short term, but the overall environmental interaction with our biology in general also has powerful effects on personal well-being and hence broad public health in many specific ways. It has been found that environmental conditions, including factors such as nutritional input, emotional security, social association, and all forms of stress in general can influence the human being in many more ways than previously thought. This process begins in utero, through the sensitive postnatal and childhood planned learning adaption periods, and carries on throughout life on all physiological and psychological levels. For example, while there is evidence that depression as a psychological disorder can have a genetic predisposition, it is the environment that really triggers it or not. Again, this is not to downplay the influence of biology on our personalities, but to show the critical importance of understanding these realities and adapting our social system and macro influences to support the most positive outcome we can. Changing the condition the idea of changing society's influences slash pressures to bring out the best of the human condition rather than the worst is at the core of the social imperative of TZM and this idea is sadly lost in the culture's social considerations today. 
Enormous evidence exists to support how the influence of our environment is what essentially creates our values and biases and while genetic and physiological influences can set propensities and accentuations for certain behaviors, the most active influence regarding our variability is the life experience and condition of the human being, hence the manner of interaction between the internal, physiological, and external, environmental. In the end, the most relevant issue is stress. Our genes, biology and evolutionary psychology might have some hang-ups, but they are nothing compared to the environmental disorder we have created in our culture. The enormity of now unnecessary stress in the world today, debt, job insecurity, increasing health risks both mental and physiological and many other issues have created a climate of unease that has been increasingly making people sick and upset. If we were faced with an option to adapt our society in a way that could provably better public health, increase social stability, generate abundance and help sustainability, would we not just do it? To think human beings are simply incompatible with methods that can increase their standard of living and health is extremely unlikely. So, in conclusion to this section, let it be stated that the subject of human nature is one of the most complex issues there is when it comes to specifics. However, the broad and viable awareness with respect to basic public health improvement via reducing stress, increasing quality nutrition and stabilizing society by working toward abundance and ease rather than strife and complexity, is not susceptible to much debate. We now have some refined truths about the human condition that give enough evidence to see that we are not only generating poor reactions and habits due to the influence of the current socioeconomic order, we are also greatly disrespecting the habitat as well creating not only a lack of sustainability in an ecological sense, but, again, in a cultural sense as well. Once again, to think humans are simply incompatible with these resolutions, even if it means changing our world greatly, defies the long history of adaptation we have proven to be capable of.